Muy buenas tardes. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Marusha Arana from Aditech Foundation, the coordinator of Navara's innovation system, SINAI, and the organizer of Science Teca uh, Science Competition and Gala. Welcome to our second conference within the framework of our science culture activities and uh, the Science Kaitsa event to be held in Navarra Arena on June the 25th this year. We will have Fura del Spaus as a show to pay homage to science creation. We have sold out. Thank you very much to Londa Schivinger for participating as a jury and a speaker in Science Ekaitsa. Before we continue, I would like to say thank you to all companies and organizations that made Science Ekaitsa possible. For instance, the government of Navarra and the Ministry of Science and Innovation through the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. Thank you too to the companies that trusted us from the very beginning, Narcetic, Viscofan, and Navarra's Public University, Dana and Ivetrola, and our partners, Reino Gourmet, Hotel Tres Reyes, Guk, and Elcar. To finish my acknowledgements, I would like to refer to our collaboration with the Navarran Institute for Equal Opportunities to contribute to, to equality through science excellence since 2019 at ITEC is the coordinator of a project research with a gender dimension, which seeks to contribute to the Navarran science excellence uh, framework by providing a gender dimension into the contents of research projects in our region. In October, a uh, conference will be organized with uh, high statute figures to learn more about the gender dimension in science and technology. Before I introduce you to our guest speaker, for you to enjoy our conference to the full, I would like to give you a couple of um, tips. You can choose your language, English or Spanish. You have an icon at the bottom of your screen and an interface. You can select either English or Spanish to follow the translation. We will also have a question round to Londa. If you want to ask a question, please type it in into the bottom of your screen in the dedicated section and Londa will answer your questions. Uh, finally, uh, at the end of the talk, you will be shown a very, very short questionnaire, satisfaction questionnaire for us to continue improving. So thank you in advance for participating. Now, let me introduce you to our guest speaker, Londa Schibinger. She's a professor in history of science in Stanford University. She has a PhD by Harvard University and a member in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is internationally renowned for her work in gender and science, and she's the director of Gendered Innovations, a program launched by the European Commission and the United States to include the gender dimension into scientific and technological research to Aditech. It is a real honor to have such a such an important international speaker with us today. Londa, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> so I'll start by sharing slides. And there we go. You can see them. Yes, Marusha. Yes, good. So if it will advance. There we are. Today we explore gendered innovations. Gendered innovations was produced by a large international collaboration involving the European Commission, the US National Science Foundation, and Stanford University. We've now expanded into Japan and South Korea. We're very pleased with this. South Africa and several Latin American countries, including Brazil and Argentina. Gendered Innovations has brought together over 200 basic scientists, engineers, and gender experts in a series of collaborative workshops. 
New policies have been implemented across the European Union, Canada, and the US. And we've now expanded into Silicon Valley with a series of tech roundtables for industry leaders such as Google, Facebook, and the like. Innovation is about integrating sex, gender, and intersectional analysis uh, for discovery. The question is, how can we harness the creative power of sex and gender and intersectional analysis for discovery? Does this approach add a valuable dimension to research? Does it take research in new directions? Now, why might this be important for your research? Uh, the European Commission, just recently beginning in 2020, the European Commission with its Horizon Europe strengthened the gender dimension in research. They now require that you integrate sex and gender analysis into the design of your research. And if it's not relevant to your research, you must justify that, is, that it is not relevant. Otherwise, you will not be funded for the particular research. And I'm happy to learn that right here in Navarra, in 2020, the R&D call for proposals asks that projects include sex and gender analysis and gives more points for those that properly consider the gender dimension. And this was promoted through the ADI text project, Research with gender, the Gender Dimension. I find this all very exciting that this is happening all around the world. Now, first, let me give you a little bit of background. Governments and universities in the US and Western Europe have taken three strategic approaches to gender equality over the past several decades. The first is to fix the numbers of women. This focuses on increasing the numbers of women and underrepresented groups in science and engineering. The second is fixing the institutions. And this promotes gender equality in careers through structural change in research institutions to make the organizations friendly for the newcomers. And the third is fix the knowledge or gendered innovations, which stimulates excellence in science and technology by integrating sex and gender analysis into research. And my talk today will focus on this third strategic approach, fixing the knowledge. It's the newest area and the most important for the future of science, engineering, and innovation. And this is what gendered innovations is all about. So let's dive in. Doing research wrong costs lives and money. For example, 10 drugs were recently withdrawn from the US market because of life-threatening health effects, and eight of those pose greater threats for women. I don't know if you know how much it costs to develop a new drug, but they cost billions of dollars to develop. And when they fail, they cause human death and suffering. We can't afford to get it wrong. But doing research right can save lives and money. This uh, WHI hormone therapy trial was a very large trial in the United States done in the 1990s at our National Institutes of Health. And it has been found that for every dollar invested by the government in this research, $140 were returned to the US taxpayer in healthcare savings. So the study also saved lives. There were, so, there were fewer uh, heart attacks, cardiovascular disease events, there were fewer breast cancers and more quality adjusted life years. The downside is that there were more, more osteoporotic fractures. So I like these kinds of metrics. We have some for the medical fields, but we need some for the engineering field, for example. It's crucially important to get the research right from the very beginning. And this is the goal of Gendered Innovations. Our project develops state-of-the-arts methods of sex and gender analysis and provides case studies or concrete examples to illustrate how gender analysis leads to discovery and innovation. Now, before I start giving you the examples of how using sex and gender analysis 
increases the quality of science, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with the words that we're using. So what do I mean by the words sex and the word gender? So sex is very simple. It's biological characteristics like height and weight, uh, which is important to like uh, uh, safety for crash test dummies in cars, height and weight. It could be genes and hormones, um, this sort of thing. By contrast, gender is sociocultural attitudes and behaviors, the kinds of clothes we wear, the sort of language we use, the occupations that we choose. And importantly, sex and gender interact. And Vera Regetza Grosik, who is a powerhouse for gender medicine in Europe, has made this very nice illustration uh, for us. So her point is that sex, and here she's talking about genes and hormones, interact with social factors. And she's highlighting nutrition and lifestyle. It could be gender, it could be ethnicity, it could be socioeconomic status. And these interact over the course of the lifetime to make us who we are as adults. Now, a lot of us think of sex and gender in binary terms, such as male and female, man and woman, but gender is quickly moving beyond just men and women. A 2016 US poll, which was also redone in 2020, showed that 0.6% of the population or nearly 2 million people in the US identify as transgender. Of course, there are other flavors of gender, such as gender fluid, non-binary. Um, these were not reported in this study. And we know that some, that some 15 countries allow a third sex category on legal documents, such as birth certificates, passports, and the like. These countries include Germany and India. And in the United States, there are 13 states that allow for a third sex. I'm not aware that this is an option in Spain, but I'd be very interested to learn. So now let's go back to why 10 drugs failed and were withdrawn from the US market. There are many reasons why drugs fail and fail more often for women. One reason is that the research is done in males, whether in humans, animals, or cells and tissues. This study was done in 2011 by some of our colleagues at Berkeley. And it shows the sex of the animal used in research. And you see that blue, the male, is the most common animal used. The female animal, the mouse, is used more only in reproduction and immunology here. But what I'm interested in is this gray area where the sex of the animal is not recorded. This is research money wasted. You might as well throw it out the window because you don't get the correct results. A similar study was done at Mayo Clinic on cells and tissues. And here, look, it's almost all gray area. The sex of the cell is almost never reported. And again, this is research money wasted. So now I want to uh, go to our website. I'm going to talk to you about stem cell research. and give you one example of how including sex and gender, in this case, sex, um, in your research gives you better results. And you can use, you can see our website, yes, Marisha? Yes. Um, so this is the website live and you can use it. It's a public resource, anybody can come. Here we have our general methods. You see, we have methods for analyzing sex analyzing gender, intersectional approaches. And here are our case studies in buckets of science, health and medicine, engineering, lots of interesting ones here, and environment. So I want to first talk about stem cells and how analyzing sex improves the science. <clears throat> Why might the sex of the cell be relevant? Research shows that there are sex differences in the therapeutic capacity of stem cells. This slide shows stem cells taken from muscle tissue, and it shows simply that the female stem cell is more active or more therapeutic than the male stem cell. 
Yet very few researchers consider the sex of the cell, which can lead to failed research. An international research team from Norway and Australia worked with stem cells in mice and they appropriately used male and female animals. They used male, both male and female mice, but when it came to the stem cells, they used all female stem cells. This was an unconscious and arbitrary decision. It means that in the discovery phase, they did not see anything unique to the male stem cell nor did they detect important differences in function between male and female cells. The result of not considering sex of the stem cell was that their male mice died and they didn't know why. They thought maybe a postdoc made a mistake when in doubt, blame your postdoc. But eventually through a gendered innovations workshop in Norway, the team realized that they also needed to consider the sex of the stem cell. And they found that matching, they found that matching the donor and the recipient, so the stem cell and the animal, male to male and female to female, yielded the best results. Then their animals, their male animals didn't die. But of course, you have to look at, you have to study all the possibilities before you make any decisions. All combinations must be considered before being ruled out. But of course, it's never that easy. Many factors have to be taken into account. In the case of stem cells, these factors might include the cell type, the disease being treated, or other variables, whether those are hormonal, immunological, or environmental. And now I'm going to go back. <clears throat> Okay, so um, my point in this lecture is that the gender dimension in research enhances excellence in science and technology. When you consider the sex of the cell, the sex of the animal and how these interact, you get better results. It also, the gender dimension also enhances innovation and discovery. It also enhances social equity and for businesses, it can in create more patents and enhance profitability. Now, my next example comes from computer science. I'm going to give you examples from different areas of science. Uh, maybe I'll hit on the area that you are involved in. So next, I'm looking at computer science, specifically machine translation. And as you know, that involves natural language processing. So I start with a story. Some years ago, I was in Madrid, which is a lot of fun, and interviewed by some Spanish newspapers. I don't read Spanish. I read a number, you know, I read French and German, but I don't read Spanish. So when I returned home, I put the articles through Google Translate, and I was shocked that I was referred to repeatedly as he. Londa Schiebinger, he said, he wrote, and sometimes it thought. Google translation has a male default. So how can such a cool company as Google make such a fundamental error? Google translate defaults to a masculine pronoun because he said is more commonly found on the web than she said. So here's uh, that image that you can see. Um, this is the interesting part. We know from Ngram, which is another Google product, that the ratio of he said to she said um, has fallen dramatically. So it was always four to one. So he said appears four times more often than she said on the internet. And that peaked in 1968 and then dropped dramatically until the 2000s and 10s. And this drop here was the result of a huge revolution in US culture. There was the women's movement. There was the government that was supporting uh, increasing the number of women in science. We had a movement to create equality in language. And with one algorithm, Google wiped out 40 years of revolution and they didn't mean to. This was completely unconscious gender bias. So the fix, 
what we do at Gendered Innovations, we do workshops. So a couple of years after we discovered this, we held a workshop and we invited two natural language processing experts, one from Stanford and one from Google. And they listened for about 20 minutes and they thought maybe I was a crazy woman, but they finally got it and they said, oh, we can fix that. So fixing is great, but constantly retrofitting for women is not the best road forward. I had to ask myself, how is it that Google engineers, many of whom are educated at Stanford, my own university, how could they make such a simple mistake? You have to remember that Google is 20 minutes down the street from Stanford. So I probably taught a number of these engineers. What are we at Stanford doing wrong? Well, for one thing, we don't teach gender analysis in the core engineering curriculum. You can come over to history and take a course, but we don't teach it where the students live right in the engineering department. This is something that we're now trying to fix. So again, some products can be fixed, but what if Apple, Google, and other companies started product development research by incorporating gendered innovations? What innovative new technologies, softwares, and systems could be conceived? The point I want to make is that this unconscious gender bias from the past amplifies gender inequality into the future. When trained on historic data, as Google Translate is, the system inherits, inherits the bias, including the gender bias. So when a translation program defaults to he said, it again increases the relative frequency of the masculine pronoun on the web and may reverse the hard one advances toward gender equal language. It turns out that even though Google wanted to fix the problem, they've been unable to. They've had a few kind of updates um, in recent years, but it doesn't, I put the story back through Google just a month ago and it's not fixed. So it's always harder to fix something once the basic platform is set. So importantly, Google Translate is creating the future. We know that technology, our devices, our programs, and, proce and processes shape human attitudes, behaviors, and cultures. In other words, past bias is perpetuated into the future even when governments, universities, and companies themselves, like Google, have implemented policies to foster equality. So the big question is how can we humans intervene in these automated processes to create the societies we want. Now, there are many uh, examples like Google Translate where unintentional bias is built into the algorithm or the system's software. One example, another example is Google Search. So if you're searching for a job, men are five times more likely than women to be offered ads for high paying executive jobs. So in the US, those are jobs that are about $160,000 a year or over. Now, why is that? Again, it's the data. Men in the United States and almost everywhere earn about 20% more than women earn overall. And the job of Google search is to return the right ad to the right person. So uh, Google knows very well if you're a man or a woman and they think, aha, this is a high paying job that must be for a man. So it, it's the problem of the data. Now here's another kind of um, bias in the data and this has to do with computer vision, very big field in computer science. And this we highlighted in our nature comment from 2018, I call this the two bride problem. Here you see the images of two brides. One, the one in white is a North American traditional American bride, North American bride. And the one here is a traditional North Indian bride. So a photograph of the traditional US bride is correctly labeled in, uh, the, in the program as bride, dress, woman, wedding. But the photograph of a North Indian bride is labeled as performance art, costume, red. The data is such that the program doesn't recognize this 
woman as also a bride. So why is that? The issue again has to do with biased data. In this case, in ImageNet, um, a data, this is a data set of 14 million labeled images that fuels research in computer vision. More than 45% of the images come from the US, even though we're only 4% of the global population. By contrast, China and India have only 3% of the data in this data set, but they're 36% of the global population. So we need data sets with appropriate geodiversity. And you can see this also in devices. And now I'm coming to the issue of race and ethnicity, another axis of bias. So we know that soap dispensers don't work for people with darker skin. There's a video online that went viral and a white man puts his hand under the soap dispenser and he gets soap. And a darker man puts his hand under the soap dispenser and nothing happens. It doesn't work for people with darker skin. And why is that? The device uses a near infrared technology that doesn't detect the hand, close the circuit and dispense the soap. So this is more serious when it's heart monitors. Even the Apple watches don't work for people with darker skin. And this may put those people at risk for serious conditions such as heart disease. And I want to say something about the pulse oximeter. Um, so the pulse oximeter became very popular during COVID. You know, we, it costs $20, you can have one at home. You put your finger in it and uh, you can learn what your oxygen saturation is. Do you need to go, you have COVID, do you need to go to the hospital? Are you low on oxygen? Well, these devices all work fine on men. I should say I have to put it on my middle finger because my finger's smaller. This was made for men. And so my finger is smaller. So instead of this one, anyway, um, the pulse oximeter doesn't report accurately the oxygen saturation in patients with darker skin. And why is that? The pulse oximeter measures the oxygen saturation in the blood by shining again an infrared light through the finger that measures the oxygen in the blood. The problem is that the red light, it sees the oxygen, but it also sees the melanin or the pigment in darker skin and that confuses the reading. It makes the, the oximeter think that there's more oxygen when there is not. So this means that COVID patients, for example, may not get the supplemental oxygen they, they need, leading to organ failure. <clears throat> this has been known since 1989, many years, but not corrected. And we have to remember that all the wearables, the Apple Watch, the Fitbit, all of these things are used now for health monitoring and they all use the light signals and they all have similar problems. So we're looking to you technologists to fix this and to design your devices so that they work for everyone from the very beginning. We should not have to go through this process of product design, market failure, and redesign. We need to get things right from the very beginning. Now, each of the examples I've given you so far are important, but what did you notice about them? Each example focused on only one social dimension in isolation. Google search, Google translate, image recognition, those were all about gender. Uh, the soap dispenser, the pulse oximeters, those were about race. That's why we need a higher level of analysis and that is called intersectionality or intersectional approaches. So what do we mean by intersectionality? Intersectionality describes the overlapping or intersecting forms of discrimination related to gender and ethnicity and age and socioeconomic status and geographic location and abilities. Um, the, term, the term was coined in 1989 by Kimberly Crenshaw to describe how multiple forms of discrimination intersect. So I am not just a woman, I am a woman with an ethnicity, I am a woman with an age, 
I am a woman with a sexual orientation. We have to consider the whole person. So let me show you how this works in research on facial recognition. So now I'm coming to facial recognition. And this is research done by Joy Bulamwini, shown here, and it's called Gendered Shades. And she has a marvelous video online. I don't have time to show it, but I, you, should, you should go find it. Gendered Shades studies intersectionality and specifically how gender and race intersect and shows that facial recognition does not work for black women. So Joy Bulamwini, she's a researcher for facial recognition and to get the system to recognize her, she had to hold up a white mask. It did not see her in her natural skin tone. So here's how, how intersectional analysis works. First, you have the gender analysis. We know that the system performed better on men's faces than on women's faces. Then we have the race analysis. The system performed better on lighter skin than on darker skin. But when you get to the intersectional analysis, you see that the system performed worse for black women with an error rate of 35%. Whereas it performed not so bad, but not so well for darker skinned men at 12%, lighter skinned women, the error rate was only 7%. And look at white men. Okay, 99% of the time, the program got it right. So we have to consider intersectionality, but there's more for facial recognition. If we do a sexuality analysis, the system cannot recognize transgender phases, especially during the transition period, because uh, transgender people often take hormones, which can change the shape of your face. So they aren't they, they look different at different times. Um, then there's also the gender analysis, and we should all know this, makeup, facial cosmetics reduce the accuracy of facial recognition up to 76%. So, you know, facial recognition is now used when you go through the international borders. Um, so maybe you took a 12 hour flight, but you better put your makeup back on, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> So let me add, getting the data right and making technology see everyone is one aspect of the problem with facial recognition, but there are larger, I guess I should come back to this side. There are larger issues of security. Transgender people, for example, may not want to be tracked by facial recognition systems at all. The potential misuse of facial recognition has led to several actions in Belgium, for instance, Belgium has declared the use of all facial recognition illegal. San Francisco doesn't let the police use it. IBM has gotten out of the business completely. So we have to be careful. We want facial recognition to work for everyone, but we have to be careful how we use it. Now, gendered innovations is solution-based, and I don't have time to go through all the solutions uh, for each of these problems, but you can read about them. Uh, we have a wonderful, um, uh, case study on our website about machine learning, analyzing gender. Um, and then James O and I wrote a comment in Nature, uh, AI, how to make it fair. And then uh, four of us did uh, a, uh, um, an article in Nature, how sex and gender analysis improves science and engineering. So you can do that. So now let me shift from computer science to civil engineering. And I want to talk about the design of cities and public transportation. So again, I'm giving you a taste of this, some concrete examples of how sex and gender analysis, intersectional analysis can improve science and technology in many different fields. So now I'm going to um, public transportation. And the example here is about how to conceptualize data collection. How do you collect? What are the categories for data collection? So to give this some flesh, I'll use an example from public transportation. And this is work by my dear friend and colleague, Inez Sanchez de Madariaga, who is a professor in Madrid and also a co-director of Gendered Innovation. She just won some big prize in Spain, so watch for her. So here's the study. 
urban planners who are developing transportation systems for like metros, subways, trains, they study how people use trains, subways, and bus systems. And here the gendered innovation is reconceptualizing how data are collected and analyzed. So traditionally, this is the before and this is the after, traditionally um, the civil engineers use the categories, use these categories to see how people use public transportation. They looked at employment, they looked at personal use, escorting, taking someone somewhere, shopping, leisure, health, these sorts of things. And what you see here is that the mobility of care or care related trips is not a category of analysis. And this, so this is then uh, uh, Sanchez de Madariaga's work, and that is to develop the concept of the mobility of care. And she makes care related trips a dedicated category for data collection. And you see when you do that, it becomes the second most important reason that people travel. Number one is always employment, but number two is taking the children to daycare or helping an elderly parent or you know, doing some caring work using public transportation. Then there is the personal, the escort, escorting, the shopping and that sort of thing. So in the traditional way, this caring work was hidden under these other categories. And when you gather them up and make it a dedicated category, then it becomes its own important category for data analysis. So why is this important? People who travel for employment, so people who travel for employment and people who travel for care related work have different travel patterns. People who travel for employment go to work and back again back home. They just go one, one place and back another. People who travel for caring work have what are called change trips. They have a different pattern of travel. They might, they travel to work. Well, first they travel to the daycare center and drop off the children. Then they travel to work. And then when they're traveling home, they go back to the daycare. They might go by the grocery store. They might go to the dry cleaners and then they go home again. So they have a very different pattern of travel that needs to be taken into consideration than the people who just travel for employment. Conceptualizing what, um, uh, what Inez Sanchez de Madariaga calls the mobility of care as a category of analysis is something new and exciting. And incorporating the concept mobility of care creates more efficient transportation systems reduces costs and enhances the quality of life. And now I have one last example and I want to talk about robots because for sure the robots are coming. And these many of these are assistive technologies. They're assistive robots for elderly people. They're assistive robots for kids with autism, but yes, they're coming and they're coming kind of everywhere. You can find them in restaurants, you can find them in airports, they're all around. So robots are designed in a world alive with gender norms, gender identities and gender relations. And here I'm showing you gender norms. These are the unspoken rules of gender that we find in the workplace, that we find in the family, and these all press upon an individual to act in a certain way. So this is part of culture. And humans, whether as designers or users, tend to gender machines. Machines don't have any gender, but we tend to assign gender to a machine because in human culture, gender remains a primary social category. Many robot designers and specialists in human robot interaction argue that gendering machines, gendering robots can be good because it best fits human expectations. So for example, should a nursing robot, a nursing robot, should it be gendered female because this fits the user's expectations since most nurses are female? Will the patient collaborate better with the robot? Will the patient take their medication? Will they do their exercises? Will they comply with the robot's instructions? But there's a danger here. 
As soon as users assign gender to a machine, stereotypes follow. Similar to what I've discussed in machine learning, the danger is that gendering robots will reinforce gender inequalities in human society by hardening current stereotypes. So for example, if we design the nursing robot to be female, do we make it more difficult for men to become nurses? In the US right now, nursing is a good job and we only have 10% of nurses who are men, but more men would like to be nurses. So we should not harden that stereotype by making our robot nurses appear female. So designing hardware toward current stereotypes might amplify those stereotypes into the future. So the challenge for designers is to understand how gender becomes embodied in robots and to design robots that promote social equality. So what gender is a robot? How would you read this robot, Pepper? It's made by SoftBank, which is a Japanese company, but I think originally it was a French company. And there are many things that gender a robot. It's anatomy, it's name, it's voice, it's color, and it's personality. So let's look at the anatomy first. Pepper's anatomy is really confusing. Do you see Pepper as a man or a woman? Seriously. We have this very narrow waist here that makes it seem feminine. <clears throat> but then you have like this skirt for legs which, well, I guess that also makes it feminine. Um, but we have to remember that Japanese men traditionally, you know, the samurai traditionally wear skirts too. So I don't know, it could be something else. But uh, the, the fact that there's no hair kind of makes the robot look boyish. So it's confusing. It's boyish. It looks feminine. Um, too many things here. Okay, then we have the name Pepper. Now in English, Pepper is very nicely non-gendered. I don't know any peppers. The designers of this robot call it a he. They just think it's a he. Um, but Pepper, the only Pepper I know was in the Iron Man movies. Gwyneth Paltrow was the assistant was named Pepper, but it's a very non-gendered name. But she was an assistant just like this robot is an assistant. So there's a gendered kind of uh, something there that we want to be careful about. Then we have the voice. The voices, voices are full of, of cultural information. The pitch of a voice indicates whether it's a male, a female, or a child. And Pepper's voice is very childish. It's interesting that many assistive technologies have a childish voice because a childish voice is perceived as non-threatening. Um, but almost always, if you think of your Siri, if you think of your Alexa, those almost always have female voices and they are almost always assistants. And this hardens that stereotype that women's role in culture is to assist. So we want to avoid that. Um, there's a very interesting development for voices and that is Q. In Denmark in 2019, the Danes created a genderless voice. Uh, you can do that with the pitch of the voice, the Hertz that it's done at. And so um, you can listen to it online. When I listened to it, all I tried to decide was whether it was a male or a female. But anyway, it's genderless. It's supposed to be, um, you know, genderless. Okay, then we come to color. Now, I don't have time to really show you that by default, all of the robots are white. Just think about the robots you've seen. Yeah, sure, they're white plastic, but nonetheless, they're all white. So one solution might be to have customizable skin colors, skin tones. Um, here we see Milo. Milo is a robot that's available in a variety of skin tones you can choose. And Milo is designed for learners with autism. It's to assist autistic children. And because autism affects four times as many boys as girls, this robot is perhaps rightly imaged as a male, but you know, that means there's still lots of girls with autism. So maybe we still need a gendered innovation where you not only select the skin tone, but you could select the sex of your robot. I think that that would be a very nice thing to do. So our challenge to roboticists is to use 
um, we want the roboticist to create a virtuous circle. We want robotics to be a catalyst for changing gender norms. So you have the engineer who has the opportunity to challenge gender norms and they create an algorithm or a robot and they should be careful that their technologies promote gender equality. That then has an impact on the user who can rethink gender norms in the culture and this will change eventually culture to become more equitable and just. That is my vision. Now I could give you many examples. We have 40 examples on our website and I encourage you to go and look at them. Integrating sex and gender analysis into research is one crucial component contributing to world-class science and technology. Innovation is what makes the world tick. And as I hope I've begun to show, gendered innovation sparks creativity by offering new perspectives, posing new questions, and opening new areas to research. Can we afford to ignore such opportunities? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Londa. Thank you so much. Uh, Londa speaks very quickly. Uh, but uh, I translated everything, Londa, just for Thank your information. You. This is me. Okay, there are a couple, there is a couple of questions from our audience. In research projects, there is a limited economic budget. How can we include the gender? dimension when your budget is tight or limited beforehand? Well, the thing is, if you don't, you're just going to have a product that fails and that's more expensive. So um, I, I don't, ex <laughs> I don't really, so it seems to me you have to choose a project that you can do correctly and in an excellent fashion and then seek funding for that. So NIH, the US National Institutes of Health recognizes they require that you use both male and female animals in animal research. They recognize that this could be more expensive and they've set aside a pot of money, $37 million to cover, that's a lot of money, to cover any extra expense. But uh, we all have to realize that if we do it without considering sex and gender, the things are not going to work. People will be harmed. And other people, if you're making a product, they just won't buy it. I will not buy anything that is not designed with, you know, with me in, in mind from the point of height and weight and these sorts of things. Okay, I bought an iPhone and they certainly aren't made for women's pockets, but gee whiz, they should be. <laughs> So um, you really have to, uh, you have to, when you're designing your research, you have to make it so that you can cover the important aspects. We have a, um, maybe I'll just share my screen for one second again, although now it's, oh yes, it's still up. Okay, so can I do that? Okay, so uh, we have in our general methods, um, say you're, Maybe you're an automobile designer and you're doing crash test dummies. Okay, so you need to think about sex. And our new methods, this is from Gendered Innovations 2, the new EC project that we had. You have to consider sex throughout the entire research project from identifying the problem. So you need to find a problem that is small enough that you can do it properly. Um, and then maybe collaborate with others to make it large enough that you can do the whole thing. And then we have these important tips for you, right? Some of the best practices in identifying the problem, designing the research, collecting the data, analyzing the data and for dissemination. So we have that for um, sex. We have that also for gender, um, for all of these things. We, and then we have specific methods. Some are for machine learning, some are for social robotics. So I really encourage you um, to go to the website 
and see what the best practices are and how you can get the research right. There's no point in doing research wrong. Thank you, Londa. Another question. Um, for a general audience that takes for granted that science and technology are totally impartial, totally unbiased and neutral from the very beginning, what would you say to the audience today and to those people who all of a sudden, you know, realize, you know, we live in 2021, how come there are examples there with, which do not consider the gender dimension? Yeah, so um, I've been, this is one of my core issues of helping people understand how science is not objective, science and technology. Um, and I think the, the thing is, I'm not interested in pointing out how it's all wrong. I want to help scientists and technologists create the research correctly from the beginning. So they need to realize what the factors to bring in so that they can make it objective, right? If you ignore gender, you don't have gender neutral science, you have gender bias science, but if you consider gender, you then have gender neutral science, right? You can create objectivity, it's the goal. But sex and gender are other variables that you have to look at when you are designing your science. They're variables that have typically been left out. So if we take car, car safety, it's shocking that automobiles are all tested with a mid-size male dummy. How dumb are we, right? We, we use this mid-sized male. So the mid-sized male, that's mid-sized by height and weight, is the default in Western culture. Medicine, uh, auto mechanics, a lot of mechanical engineering just use a mid-sized male. So um, in the 60s, I think it was, the automobile industry created a fifth percentile dummy, fifth percentile for the female population, but it was just the mid-sized male scaled down to be small for females. And it doesn't um, actually understand female skeleton, the female muscle system. It doesn't understand how the female body is injured in a car accident. And this is why women are 47% more often injured in a car accident than men are at the same speed, controlled for weight and all that sort of thing. So we have to get past these defaults, these convenient defaults that we've identified in our culture. And we need now to, um, design with everyone in mind. So in the US Congress right now, there is a bill to in fact make a 50% female crash test dummy uh, modeled on the female body. And the famous designer is Astrid, um, what's Astrid's last name? In, so there's a, a, a woman designer in Sweden who has in fact created this perfect female mid-size 50% by height and weight model so that we understand how to keep women safe in automobiles as well. So science is not excellent and objective until you consider all the variables. Thank you. Thank you, Lonta. Third and last question to Lonta. Uh, I'm going to combine, I'm going to combine a few questions here. There are several researchers who comment uh, on, well, they, they work in physics or vegetal technology, mathematics. They are asking, how can I include my, the gender dimension into my everyday research? Well, um, it's my view that some fields like pure mathematics and theoretical physics don't have a gender dimension. And so if you're applying for European Commission funds, you would just say it's not relevant to your work and you would justify it, that it's not relevant and people would accept that. It's we don't have examples. As soon as physics is applied, then we have examples because the social components come in. But um, my own son is a mathematician. There's no, you know, pure math. There just isn't a, a gender component. So we don't 
we don't try to force it where it's not relevant because there's so many places where it is relevant. As soon as you get to living organisms, there's always a sex dimension. Like we, one of our case studies is on marine organisms. We're looking at turtles. Turtles, sex is determined by temperature. So global warming is destroying turtle populations. In some parts of Australia on the Great Barrier Reef, turtle populations are now 99% female because of global warming. So we use sex analysis where it's really important, where we with policies can change the problem and where we can understand where sex analysis really understands the profound changes that are happening on earth. So that's what I want to emphasize. We use it where it's really important and in some areas it's not, but I'm waiting. I'm just thinking someday a really brilliant theoretical physicist will find a way perhaps that gender is important, but I'm not holding my breath. Thank you so much, Londa. Thank you for researching in such an innovative, exciting field, bringing together science knowledge and uh, people's needs. So from Aditech, thank you ever so much, Londa, and thank you to the audience too, not only from Spain. I know some of you are in other countries too. Thank you for your scientific curiosity that brought you here today. Uh, let me remind you, we will have um, further talks face-to-face uh, -face in Pamplona tomorrow at 11. Isabel Sola Gurperi, she is the co-director of the laboratory of the technology laboratory of the Higher Council of Research. And we also have a Pante uh, uh, the director of Atapuerca, and on on the gala day, we will have the director of Fura del Baus. For more information, please visit the website for the competition and the gala. Thank you so much, and see you soon. Bye-bye.